Okay, let's turn to God's Word again. We turn now to the Acts of the Apostles. It's very significant. It's written by Luke. Continuation of Luke's Gospel. And he says, the first account, which is Luke's Gospel, verse chapter 1, verse 1, I composed the office of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So what is the subject of Luke's Gospel? All that Jesus began to do and teach. What is the subject of Acts of the Apostles? All that Jesus continued to do and teach through his disciples. And that has continued now through 2,000 years. The Acts of the Apostles is not finished. It's continuing. The last word of the Acts of the Apostles is unhindered. The Lord, uh, it says about the Apostle Paul that he preached and taught concerning the Lord Jesus with all openness, unhindered. And there is no amen there. It goes on and on and on for 2,000 years. So that first verse is very significant. And also, though it's referring to Jesus' actions and words, I believe there's a principle involved in Acts 1.1, which we must bear in mind, that Jesus first did, then taught. He did not just teach. He did and taught. And that is the principle of the new covenant. Samson could you know, not live the life, but still be a leader, but not in the new covenant. Gideon could ultimately end up worship, worshiping idols, be a leader, but not in the new covenant. Even a man like David would disqualify to continue as a leader under the new covenant because he had so many wives and he was a leader and he fell into adultery and once a leader falls into adultery my personal conviction is though he can be restored to fellowship with the Lord he cannot be restored to leadership it's a very high standard of leadership in the new covenant so it's important that we follow this principle Jesus began to do and teach and Jesus continues to do and teach through us if we want to understand the acts of the apostles this new covenant that God has established. And verse 5, I told you, is again the promise that you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit, just like John the Baptist said. And then they asked him this question when he said, You shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They immediately thought of an earthly kingdom. You see, the mind of old covenant people is always on earthly things. God blessed me means he's given me money. God bless me means he's given me many children. God bless me means he's given me a house. Or God bless me means he's given me a wife. This is characteristic of old covenant people. And whenever your thinking is like that, it shows you are an old covenant Christian no matter how much you understand about the New Testament. If automatically you think that earthly blessing is God's blessing, just stop for a moment and think of the millions of people who don't worship God who have got much more blessing than you in that case. And you'll see the folly of that type of thinking. The mark of new covenant blessing is heavenly. Okay. So immediately they said, you mean we are going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? That means you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We are all going to be kings and prime ministers and defense ministers and all that here? And the Lord said, no. Sorry to disappoint you, that's not what I meant. It's not for you to know, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Lord has put in his own power. That's a very important verse, verse 7. It's not for us to know about times and seasons. That's in God's hand. When Jesus is going to come, I don't know. That's not for me to know. But what I do need to know is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now there are a lot of Christians today, for example, when they study Revelation, the book of Revelation, they're always interested in times and seasons. The very thing which it says in verse 7 you should not be interested in. 
What we need is the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're seeking God for something, don't seek for an understanding of times and seasons and prophetic details, but for the power of the Holy Spirit. What is the mark, the identifying mark of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Acts 1.8, power. Jesus never said, you shall receive tongues when you are empowered with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. Now, I believe there are many, many godly men through the centuries who never spoke in tongues, but who received the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the main thing. God may also give the gift of tongues, but it's not necessarily given to everybody. Even to the church in Corinth, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, I wish you all spoke in tongues, which proves they did not all speak in tongues. So we must accept that fact, that they did not all speak in tongues even in the first century. Some people make us believe as though every first century believer spoke in tongues. It's not true. But it, was, it is God's will that every Christian should have power. Tongues is one gift. It's not the most important, certainly. But every Christian should have power. And power does not mean that you'll become an evangelist. Just because you hear the testimony of somebody like Moody or Finney, that when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, suddenly... Moody says, I preached the same sermons after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and hundreds were converted. And you think that if you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, hundreds will be converted. No. If you're an evangelist, perhaps. See, the best illustration I can use is from the human body. For a member, to be a member of this body, one sign is that the blood must flow through that member. If the blood flows through a part of this body, that's part of my body. If I have an artificial hand, that's not part of the body because the blood does not flow in it. But this little finger, the blood flows in it, so it's part of the body. That's a picture of the blood of Christ, which determines whether I'm part of Christ's body or not. But even when the blood flows in my hand, my hand may be paralyzed. So I am a member of the body. This hand is a member of the body, but it's a useless member. What does this hand need? Power. And when it gets power, will it become a mouth or a tongue? No. It will become a powerful hand. If the tongue is paralyzed, when it gets power, what will it become? It won't become a hand. It will become a powerful tongue. So if God has called you to be a mother and you get filled with the Spirit, what will you be? You won't be an evangelist. You'll be a powerful, spirit-filled mother. And if your calling is to be a teacher and God fills you with the Spirit, you'll be a powerful teacher, not a powerful evangelist. There's a wrong conception that many people have that power means we suddenly all become like tongues or all become like eyes. No. You will be powerful in that particular ministry that God has called you for. And don't ever compare yourself with somebody else. Verse 15. It says here that 120 people were gathered together in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Now, I don't know whether you remember, if you have read 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6, it says, after the resurrection of Jesus, 500 believers saw him. And Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Out of 500, only 120 waited. Not every believer is interested in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not even in the first century, not even the very first time. They all believed. They were all born again. They were happy that Jesus rose from the dead. But he said, when he said, wait for the Holy Spirit, less than one-third, less than one-fourth were waiting. That's just in passing. And verse 22 when they are looking for a replacement for Judas Iscariot, notice what they say. We need somebody who should become with us a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Not a witness of Jesus' crucifixion, but a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Now, if you read, you take a concordance and look through the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find that very frequently, I didn't get time to count it up myself, but you can do that. Very frequently, you find this phrase, witness of his resurrection. You never find the phrase, 
witness of his crucifixion. Why is that? Because if you stop at the crucifixion, you have not completed the gospel. The gospel is Christ died and rose again from the dead. Otherwise, it's a very sorrowful gospel that Christ died for our sins. Now, if you listen to average preaching of the gospel today, most evangelists do not preach the resurrection. They preach crucifixion. And even many of you, when you have gone out preaching, you have preached the cross, but you have not preached the resurrection. And that's the big difference between you and the apostles. The apostles preach the resurrection. And now let's get our focus right and say, Lord, make me a witness of your resurrection. A witness who proclaims to the world not just that Jesus died, but that Jesus rose up from the dead. Very, very important distinction. The reason a lot of Christians are gloomy is because they don't believe that Jesus rose up from the dead. I mean, they believe it in their heart, but they're not always confessing it. You know, it's like Jesus died and he was buried. And then we are like those disciples who are walking to Emmaus, gloomy, long-faced. What a difference there was when they were, when they realized Jesus rose up from the dead. So we are called in this world to be witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, it says here that when they were waiting there, the day of Pentecost came, and these people did not know when they were waiting that in 10 days they would receive. If they had known it would be 10 days, it would be easy to wait. When God keeps us waiting, he never tells us what is the last day. It may be 10 days, it may be 10 years. In waiting, we have to wait in faith. Watch and pray, waiting in faith. And there is no faith if you know the end of that waiting period. So when you pray for something, God does not tell you when the end of that waiting period is going to be. Afterwards, when you look back, you say, yeah, I had to wait for that for three days. Or for the other thing, I had to wait for three years. But faith means I don't know when the end is going to be. When they were waiting on the Lord in Jerusalem, they did not know it was ten days. They didn't know whether it would be ten years. They knew they had to wait until they were endued with power from on high. When you wait on the Lord for the power of the Holy Spirit, wait until you are endued with power from on high. Is this important? It's absolutely important. And if you had gone to those disciples when they were waiting and asked them, how will you know whether you are baptized in the Holy Spirit? What would the answer be that they would give you? They would not say we would speak in tongues like people say today. They would say, Jesus said we will receive power. That's how we will know. And then people say, how do you know you got power? Well, in some way, God will assure us, just like God assures us, that our sins are forgiven. Can you explain to an unbeliever how you are so sure that your sins are forgiven? And yet you know deep down in your heart your sins are forgiven? In exactly the same way, the Holy Spirit who bears witness with your spirit that your sins are forgiven, can also give you a witness that you have been endued with power. That's how we know. So they were expecting power. But when they got power, they also got tongues. Now the tragedy today is, a lot of people have got tongues without power. It's like if you go to the marketplace and go to buy a bottle of Nescafe instant coffee, and when you go there, the shopkeeper says, you can also get a free mug along with that. You didn't go for the mug. You went for the Nescafe. You went for the power. And along with the power, they, God says you can also have the tongues. That's good. And you're so happy. You went for Nescafe, but you got Nescafe plus the free mug. You went for power, but you got power plus tongues. Now, I find two extremes among Christians today. Some people, they go to the shop and they say, I don't like mugs. I've got, I don't like mugs. I just want the Nescafe. Okay, the shopkeeper says, then don't take the mug. Just take the Nescafe and go. And that's what God says. Some people say, I don't like speaking in tongues. Okay, don't take it. Take the power and go. But the more foolish people are the ones who leave the bottle of Nescafe behind and come back with just the mug. <laughs> say, I got the mug. <laughs> Brother, you spend 100 rupees to get this mug? That's the folly of today. They've got tongues without power. So we see that power is the identifying mark and never forget that. 
The important thing is not the noise and the wind and all those things. No, it's the reality of power. You see, the, it's like getting a gift. Supposing you get a diamond, a very expensive diamond costing many, say, hundreds of thousands of rupees. And it's wrapped up in nice blue paper with red ribbon or it's wrapped up in newspaper. What difference does it make? Do you keep the ribbon or do you keep the diamond? Somebody got it in a newspaper, somebody got it in a nice package. It doesn't make a difference. The important thing is the gift inside. Babies are taken up with the wrappings. Babies are taken up with the external aspects. Oh, the wind, the fire, the excitement, the electric shock, the, the sound, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but the mature people are taken up with the gift, which is a diamond, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what, they, that's what you need to be taken up with. The external wrappings of wind, fire, so many other things like that. Well, let God give it in any wrapping he wants, so long as you get the power. It says here that tongues of fire sat on everybody's heads, which means that the Lord was saying from this day onwards, the most important part of this body, which I'm going to be using in this new covenant age, is the tongue. It has to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit and therefore your tongue must be completely under the control of the Holy Spirit all the time. Your mother tongue especially or whatever language you speak in. And then they also spoke in other tongues in verse 4. But it's the control of the tongue that is emphasized in verse 3. The tongue under the control of the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day. Do you want your tongue to be used by God in the pulpit? Give your tongue to God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. And God will test you on that for some time. And when he sees that you're faithful with that, he will use your tongue when you stand up in the pulpit. But if you don't give your tongue to God every day of the week, and you suddenly expect God to use your tongue when you stand up in the pulpit, I'm sorry he's not going to use it. Because he does not take your tongue on loan as a rent. Uh, you, rent you loan out your tongue to God for a few hours and the rest of the time you give it to the devil. No, it must be God's all the time. Okay, <clears throat> we move on to verse 17. This is the fulfillment, Peter says, of the prophecy of Joel. Verse 22 and 23, it says about Jesus, men of Israel, listen. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs. It's very interesting that the spirit-filled Peter calls Jesus still a man. A man. Do you know that even today Jesus is a man? He is God, but he's not given up his humanity. 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 5 says, There is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. We use the phrase the God man. He is God and man, true. The Bible never uses the phrase God man. It says the man Christ Jesus. And Peter was not hesitant to call him the man at the right hand of the Father. A man attested by the Father. Because he has identified himself with our humanity totally. It's not only when he came to earth, even after his ascension. He is still the man Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father. This man, this is a beautiful verse, verse 23, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross and put him to death and God raised him up again. That means even though you are the fellows who put him to death, it was according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. That's a tremendous verse predetermined plan foreknowledge that means he knew it in advance and you fellows did not know that but God already knew what you're going to do he had already determined a plan knowing that you're going to kill Jesus he was going to use it for the salvation of the world now the same thing applies to us when people harm you remember Acts 2 23 they're harming you when you go to preach the gospel is according to the predetermined plan 
and foreknowledge of God. Yeah, that cannot happen to you without the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. He permits it, and that's why He allows somebody to harm you. And therefore, you can be assured that God's purpose will be fulfilled even in what those people do. And just like I have often quoted Romans 8 28, all things work together for good, even the evil that other people do, in this way. What is the worst thing that ever happened in this world? The worst sin that was ever committed on this earth? You know, that was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The worst sin that was ever committed on this earth was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, next question. What is the best thing that ever happened on this earth? Crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's how our sins are forgiven. So what do we learn from that? That the worst thing that the devil did, God converted into the very best thing. And the worst that the devil can do to you, God can also convert into the very best thing because it is according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Okay, verse 38 the first time the gospel was preached, this is how Peter preached it. Repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today, people do not, when they preach the gospel, they do not preach repentance. They do not preach water baptism. They do not preach baptism of the Holy Spirit. What do they preach? Believe. Yeah, Peter included believe. If you didn't believe, you don't get baptized. But unfortunately, in a lot of evangelistic preaching today, there is no mention of repentance because you won't get so many people if you preach repentance, but you'll get genuine people. There's no mention of water baptism because you don't want to offend the people who believe in child baptism. There's no mention of baptism in the Holy Spirit because you don't want to offend the people who don't believe in that. Thank God Peter was free from all that. He preached, repent, be baptized, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. That's the first time the gospel was preached. They preached the whole counsel of God. Peter was not a diplomat like today's evangelist, trying to please everybody. He only wanted to please God. Be like him. And verse 40, he not only preached the gospel, when people responded to the gospel, he told them something more. With many words, he told them, you've got to be saved from this wretched world. That's the next thing you tell people when they are converted. Be saved from this wretched world system. Verse 42, and after that, these people who are saved continued in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. It's no use having breaking of bread if you don't have fellowship. Verse 47, the Lord added to their number every day those who were saved. It's the Lord who adds to the church. I don't have to worry about that part. My part is to proclaim the gospel. The Lord will add to the church. I can never save souls. And my job is to proclaim the word. The Lord adds to the church. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is the thing which Jesus could never accomplish in his lifetime because the Holy Spirit was not there. Peter and John could never work together in the Gospels. John would always be with his brother James. In fact, they were trying to get the seats on either side of Jesus in the, in the resurrection. But things have all changed now. The Holy Spirit has come. Nobody is seeking their own. Nobody is trying to uh, promote himself. In fact, in Acts 2 verse 11 it says, sorry, not 2.11, it says in Acts chapter 2 verse 14 that when Peter stood up to speak, the leaven were with him. They did not speak. They did not say, Peter, after you speak, we also want to speak. No. They said, Peter, you speak. That's enough. And we are 100% behind you. Look at that spirit. Greater works than Jesus did. As soon as the Holy Spirit came, they were not interested in seeing who's going to get the honor to speak now. Let Peter speak. We are solidly behind him. And Peter and John, who never sort of fellowship together like this before, now go together to the hour of prayer. And in that unity, there is power. Because they find this lame man, um, and he asks for some, um, 
he was laid at his, from the mother's womb, he was lame, it says. And he used to be set down every day, verse 2, at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. And there's another verse in chapter 4, 22, which tells us this man was more than 40 years old. Okay? So this man was brought to sit at the temple probably for 20 years. Every day he was brought there to collect alms and go away. Now my question is, if he was sitting at the beautiful gate of the temple for 20 years, did Jesus ever see him? I'm sure Jesus saw him every time he went to the temple, he saw this man asking for alms. And what did Jesus give him? Money. Every time. He gave him money. You see him next week? Money. You see him after three years? He gave him money. Why didn't he heal him? Because he had no leading from the Father to heal him. Some people say Jesus just went around healing everybody. He didn't. He didn't heal this man. He saw him for three and a half years at the temple. He never healed him. And that teaches us that we're not called to do what the Father never called us to do. If Jesus had healed him, you know what would have happened? This revival that broke out here in chapter 3 and 4 would not have broken out because that fellow would not be at the temple anymore. He would have been healed long before that. There was a time for that man to be healed and that was not through Jesus but through Peter. And so Jesus was in touch with the Holy Spirit like most believers are not in touch with the Holy Spirit. They live by rules. Everybody must be healed or nobody must be healed. Jesus did not live by rules. Those who live by rules are legalistic, can never fulfill the will of God. We, we have to live by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was in touch with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit said, don't heal him. He left him. Give him money. Every time he passed him, he gave him money and thus fulfilled the will of God so that later on when Peter came, Peter said, when he asked Peter for money, Peter said, I don't have money to give you, but in the name of Jesus, stand up. And it says there was such a revival 5,000 people came to faith. Chapter 5, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. 5,000 people came to salvation because Jesus obeyed the Holy Spirit for three and a half years and did not heal somebody. Wonderful. That's a tremendous challenge to me that how I can hinder God's work if I go and do something which the Holy Spirit never told me to do. It may be a good work. Healing a man is a very good work. A lot of good works that people do hinder God's purposes. God's ways are not our ways. The clever man, the man who lives by rules, will be a hindrance to God's purposes. If Jesus had healed that man, he would have hindered God's purposes. A lot of Christians today who listen to principles and rules and live by them are the biggest hindrance to God's purposes. Who is the man who is useful in God's purposes, the man who does not live by rules but listens to the Holy Spirit who may work in one way at one time and a totally different way at another time. It's more difficult to live like this but that is a spiritual man. A legalistic man lives by rules and regulations. Everybody must be healed or nobody must be healed. Everybody must be healed at the first opportunity. This is all rules. God's purposes are different. Chapter 4 we read in um, verse 8, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see that there was more than once that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, at the end of the chapter, we read, they were praying together, and um, verse 31, they were filled with the Spirit again. So between Acts 2 and Acts 4, Peter was filled with the Spirit three times at least, which teaches us that the fullness of the Holy Spirit is not a once-for-all experience. You have to keep on being filled, 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 filled. For every ministry, you've got to keep on being filled. Yesterday's fullness is not good enough for today. Just like people say, I was born again on so-and-so date. I've met lots of people <clears throat> who say, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit on such and such a date. But I look at their life today, there's not a drop of water in their vessel. It's all leaked out ages ago. But they've got a date. Oh, that date. I feel sorry for all people who quote a, quote a date. What's she is quoting a date? Our river is flowing today. Otherwise, their date is useless. Maybe you started speaking in tongues today. You got the mug that day. Where's the bottle of Nescafe? Where's the power? Missing. 
That's the situation with lots of people today and the devils fool them left, right and center. Don't be like them. Don't go around quoting dates. Be filled with the Spirit and everybody will know it. Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 32, it says, The congregation of those who believed, before that, verse 28, again he uses that expression we found in Acts 2, to do whatever, Lord, thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. He was talking again about the crucifixion of Jesus. The apostles got a great revelation that the crucifixion of Jesus was according to the predestined plan of God and that affected all their life. And they said it to encourage themselves when they were beaten up. It says here they were beaten and sent. And when they got beaten and they said, Lord, this is all according to your predetermined plan. Praise the Lord. And um, verse 32, the congregation of those who believed were a one heart and one soul. This is how the early church was. The secret of their power was not only the fullness of the Spirit. The secret of their power was they were a one heart and one soul. They submitted to their leaders. They submitted to the apostles. And they were completely united. They were not a bunch of gossipers and critics. Like a lot of Christians today. And they did not claim that anything belonging to them was their own. This does not necessarily mean that they sold all their property. But they did not say, this is mine. You want it, you need it, brethren, here and you can have it. All things were common property to them means, you can borrow my scooter. You can have it. You want a place to stay, come and stay in my house. It doesn't mean that they sold their houses. Some people did that, and they were free to do it. But um, it was not followed right through till the end of New Testament times. There was a time when people felt, oh, we should sell our houses and do it. But... The principle of being one heart and one soul and making sure that not a needy person is there. There was no needy person among them. Verse 34. Not even one needy person. Because those who were houses, owners of lands and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds to the apostles. And so nobody remained in need because those who had excess would help those who had less. This is how the early church lived. And their power lay there. And in that type of situation, you can imagine how some people would like to take advantage of it. And Ananias and Sapphira, we read in chapter 5, tried to take advantage of it. They said, this is good. We can belong to this group. I mean, a lot of people come to our churches also like that. Because they say, oh, there are a lot of hospitable people here. There are a lot of generous people here. I'd like to be a part of this church and receive all the generosity of other people and all the hospitality of other people. Now, we've got to be very careful. If we start giving out money like that in India, you know how your church will grow in size in no time and will get corrupt in no time also because you'll get the wrong type of people. You'll get people who are not interested in righteousness but who are interested in money. Like they talked about the rice Christians in those days, in the old days, when people came to the church to get free rice, got converted for free education, got converted for free medical treatment, got converted so that they get, get a free trip to the United States, something like that. It hasn't completely gone, even today. There are people who come to Christian churches for some benefit for themselves, which they would not have got if they were in a secular job. You need to always ask yourself when you come to the church, have you profited financially by coming to the church? <laughs> then you're probably not in the will of God. The church is not a place to make financial profit, to make business contacts through the church here and there. A lot of people do that, and I've always found that they lose out spiritually. So don't take advantage of the church for your own profit. The church is a place to give. Businessmen will all be driven out of the church one day, those who try to make profit out of the church, who try to make contacts for their own benefit and gain. The church is a place where we are to give, sacrifice, not gain. Unfortunately, in India today, there are many people in Christian work who are earning five to ten times what they would have earned if they were doing a secular job. So, Christian work has become profitable for them. And so, all the non-Christians look and say, oh, these fellows become Christians for the sake of money. How shall we shut their mouths by showing them 
I'm not doing this for money. I could have made more money in a secular job. I didn't come here for money. I'm earning less than half of what I could have got in my secular job. Then their mouths are shut. But if you are earning five or ten times what you would have got in a secular job, how can you shut their mouths? This is the tragedy of Christian work in India today. So, but these people, Ananias and Sapphira, came in and thought, how can we make profit? And so they did not give all their money. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira was not that they didn't give all their money. God never wanted all their money. Peter said to them, Peter said to Ananias in Acts chapter 5, when your land was not sold, verse 4, it was yours. Even after you sold it, the money was yours. What do we learn from that? Before you sell your land, it is yours. God doesn't want it. God doesn't want you to sell it. After you sold it, the money is still yours. God doesn't want your money. But why do you tell a lie? That's my question. Why do you pretend? So what was Ananias' sin? Not that he didn't give the whole thing. Supposing he had come and said, Well, Peter, you know, we sold that land for 50,000 rupees. But my wife and I talked about it and we felt that we should only give 10,000 rupees to God. The rest we want to keep for the future. Peter was said, Wonderful, Ananias. That's good. We're thankful that you decided to give 10,000. God bless you. And he'd have been alive and gone home happily giving only 10,000 when everybody else was giving everything. That was not their sin. Their sin was they stood in the queue, kept their mouth shut, and pretended that they were giving everything. They didn't open their mouth, but Peter was a man of discernment. He said, come here, Ananias. And afterwards he gave a chance to his wife. He said, did you sell this for so much? She said, yes. Both of them died. For hypocrisy. Somebody asked me once, Brother Zach, why doesn't God do that today? I said, there'll be hardly anybody alive in the church if God does that today. <laughs> if God removes all the hypocrites in the church, how many will be left? I think there'll still be a few, but perhaps not many. But the reason was that they were in the midst of a very powerful church. You see, if Ananias and Sapphira were in some carnal church like Corinth, they would not have died. He may have even have been an elder in Corinth. You see, it depends which church you're in. If you're in a dead church, you may do a lot of wrong things. You may even be an elder. But you make the big mistake of joining a church that is pressing on to purity and you try to play the fool there. You're a proud man and you join a bunch of humble brothers who are pressing on to perfection. I tell you, God will smite you. One way or the other, he'll smite you. If you want to live, go and join some dead church. Please don't join a living church and play the fool there. Because if there is a living church and you go there and try to play the fool to get a reputation for yourself, I warn you that God will smite you. Thankfully, there are not many living churches like that, so you'll survive in most churches. But if you ever find one, be careful. Don't join it unless you're serious about your Christianity. Can't play the fool there. I've seen it happen. If they don't get smitten... Physically, they get smitten spiritually. Okay. Acts chapter 5, there's a lovely verse here. Verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. And verse 41, they rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. We may have a lot of that in India in the days to come. And when that happens to us, let us rejoice that we are counted worthy to suffer shame for his name because it says they called the apostles, verse 40, and flogged them. They took a whip and flogged all the apostles. And when they went away after getting this flogging, they didn't just go away with their head down. They lifted up their head and said, praise the Lord, I got a flogging for Jesus' sake. And they considered a great honor. It was like somebody giving them a medal or giving them an honorary doctorate or something like that and they walk away with great joy because they got a flogging for Jesus sake that's wonderful in Acts chapter 6 we read about when the disciples were increasing in number complaints started see this is the problem whenever a work grows as long as the work is small everything is wonderful but when it begins to grow murmuring starts 
grumbling starts, complaining starts, and something has to be done about it. If you allow it to remain like that, it will spread. It's like tuberculosis, chickenpox, all these things. They spread if you don't isolate the people who have got this sickness. So murmuring and complaining is like that. It spreads very, very quickly. And um, so the twelve said, hey, this is not good because the complaint is about food. Uh, some people say there's a communi community difference here, that the Jews are favoring their own widows and not taking care of the Grecian widows. You know, it was the problem was on communal lines, just like in India sometimes. And so the twelve apostles had great wisdom. They said, we got to sort out this problem, but we can't be investigating distribution of food, not because it's too lowly a task for us, but because we have to give ourselves to prayer. Notice this lovely verse, verse 4. To all those who are called to serve the Lord, please remember this verse. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word of God. That's what we're going to devote ourselves to. And we're not going to sit down and sit in a table as a director and keep signing letters. A lot of people called to preach God's word are doing that. I know many times the devil has tried to draw me by some offer of a job here in Christian organizations, sit behind a desk and sign letters. And I said, no, thank you. No matter what the salary is, we cannot do that. We are called to the minister the word. And I want to say, if you are not being gifted, there are many people who are not gifted to minister the word. Their gift is administration. Let them go and sit at tables. If you are called to minister the word of God, and that's the gift God's given you, don't ever degenerate to the level of being some director or something like that sitting at a table. Go out and be a prophet. Don't be a director of some organization signing letters. That's what the apostle said. We're not going to serve tables. And, um, but who's going to serve the tables? You need spirit-filled people. So look for people of a good testimony, filled with the Holy Spirit, who do that job. But that's not our calling. You see, the apostles stuck to their calling. That's why they fulfilled their ministry. And the other calling is also important, but somebody called to it must do it, but they must be filled with the Holy Spirit. So they selected seven people, Stephen and Philip. And you know Stephen and Philip are the ones you read of later on who became great preachers. Stephen became the first martyr. Philip was the one who went to Samaria and brought a revival there. So these people didn't just look after serving food. They started with that, like Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. But they moved on to higher ministries when they were faithful with serving food to the widows. And uh, they, it says here, the apostles prayed for them, laid hands on them. And the word of God kept on spreading. Here's a lovely verse which we can claim for ourselves. It says in verse 10 that when Stephen spoke, the others were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. And that can be our experience too, that when we speak, we speak with wisdom and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 7, we read about the history of Israel that Stephen was speaking and finally he told them, verse 52, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? He's saying every single prophet your fathers persecuted. You did not, they did not spare one of them. And that verse teaches us that every prophet in the Old Testament was unpopular. Every prophet was rejected. That's why Jesus said, leap for joy when all men speak evil of you because that's how they treated all the prophets. A prophet is different from a teacher. A teacher may be accepted. A prophet is usually not accepted. A teacher is a non-controversial figure. If a prophet is non-controversial, he's not a prophet. A prophet is always a controversial figure. Whether it is Moses or Elijah or Elisha or anybody. So... Uh, the prophets are always persecuted. Teachers and evangelists are not necessarily persecuted as much. And he says, now you've killed the last one who came as a prophet. That's Jesus Christ. And these people got so mad. Verse 54. Stephen preached in such a way that he really worked them up. 
and they were cut to the quick and they began to grind their teeth. Have you had anybody grinding their teeth when you're preaching? Well, that's what Stephen had. He was like a prophet, spoke to them. And they were sitting there mad at this man preaching and decided to destroy him. And they got a lot of false witnesses and they took him outside and threw stones at him and killed him. The first martyr of the Christian church, killed for preaching the word of God. And see this wonderful verse. He being full of the Holy Spirit, verse 55. Here is a mark of people who are filled with the Spirit. They gaze intently to heaven. A Spirit-filled man gazes at heaven and gazes intently. A Spirit-filled man sees the glory of God, doesn't care for the opposition of men. A Spirit-filled man sees Jesus standing in the right hand of God. Verse 56, a Spirit-filled man testifies to this Jesus whom he sees at the right hand of God. And verse 57, a spiritual man is usually persecuted and often killed. And we read here that um, they laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And um, Saul was agreeing to this killing of Stephen. That is the apostle, one who became the apostle Paul. And Stephen, his last words were, Lord, receive my spirit and do not hold this sin against them. A spirit-filled man commits his soul to God and a spirit-filled man forgives other people who harm him. It's a wonderful description of what it means to be filled with the spirit from verse 55 to verse 60. He forgives those who hurt him. Now, once Saul saw this, why did God allow the killing of Stephen? I believe that was the first step to the conversion of the Apostle Paul. I wonder whether Paul would ever have been converted if he had not seen the way Stephen reacted when he was killed. Saul had seen many people being stoned to death, perhaps, but he'd never seen one like Stephen. When the Roman centurion, he who had seen many people being crucified, saw Jesus, the way Jesus was crucified, without cursing, without spitting, without swearing, he said, this is the Son of God. I have never seen anybody die like this. And when Peter, uh, when Paul, Saul, saw the way Stephen died, he said, this is different. This cannot be a false religion. Something is wrong. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. And it began to prick him. And that's why later on on the Damascus road, Paul, the Lord spoke to him, it is hard for you, Saul, to kick against the pricks of conscience. When did those pricks of conscience start? When he saw the way Stephen died. The way you react to the evil somebody does to you may begin the pricks of conscience in somebody watching you. And in these last 2,000 years, there are many people who have opposed Christianity in many, many places who have been first drawn to Christ by the way they have seen Christians react to persecution. So Saul was just one of the first of those hundreds and thousands of converts through 2,000 years who got saved through seeing a godly reaction to persecution. For that, we must be filled with the Spirit. You cannot have a godly reaction to persecution if you are not filled with the Spirit. So Stephen is a unique example for us in India. And Saul was in agreement, and he went around persecuting people. In chapter 8, we read in verse 12 about the great revival that came in Samaria through Philip preaching. And there was a magician there. And it says in verse um, um, chapter 8 and verse 20 that, uh, sorry, chapter 8 and verse 13, that this magician also believed and was baptized. But when Peter came, it says Peter laid hands on the people because, verse 15, they were only born again and they had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they said Peter came. Philip could not lead them into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Philip could only lead them to salvation, forgiveness of sins, and to baptism. He would not have baptized them if they were not converted. 
They were converted and then they were baptized. But they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when Peter and John came, they prayed for them, verse 15, that they should receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Just a word about this baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No name there. And you know, even in heathen religions, they have a trinity. So, when we baptize, it's important that we identify that our trinity is not Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. It is the Trinity connected with Jesus Christ. And therefore, when I baptize, I baptize in the name of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Why? I am saying I believe not in that Trinity, all the heathen trinities there are in the world, but the Trinity where the Son is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what Jesus commanded. And at the same time, identifying the Son as Jesus Christ means it is a baptism in the name of Jesus. It does not mean, like many people do today, where they deny the Father and the Holy Spirit and baptize only in the name of Jesus. That's not what the apostles did. And then they laid hands on them, verse 17, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that you could get the Spirit, that the Spirit was bestowed through laying on of hands, he gave money. See, here is an example of a person, perhaps the first person in the Christian history, who tried to get, a, get something spiritual by giving money. And Peter refused to receive that money. He says, your gift perish with you. Because you thought you could get the gift of God by money. Do you know that there are many rich people who try to bribe preachers today with money? Simon was a rich man. Don't allow any rich man to bribe you with money. And if you sense that that man's heart is not right, give it right back. That's what Peter said. He said, I don't want your money. Be careful about whom you receive money from. Peter did receive money from different people, but not from Simon. We need to be discerning. If you love money so much, you'll just receive it from anybody and everybody. Receiving money as a servant of the Lord is an act of fellowship. I would receive, but not from everyone. There are people from whom I've said, I'm sorry. I usually tell them I don't need it, brother. I'm okay. I don't want to insult them. But I don't feel free to receive from certain people. And Peter didn't feel free to receive from Simon. Because there was no fellowship. And the Lord said, and Peter said, your money perish with you. And as I said earlier, in the middle of that revival, the Lord told Peter to go to the desert, verse 26. And there in the desert, he meets this Ethiopian eunuch who gets converted and takes the gospel to Ethiopia. In chapter 9, we read of the conversion of Saul. On the road to Damascus, he gets hit by this light and blinded. And the question he asked Jesus is, in the King James Version, it is there, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, what will you have me to do? Verse 5. Who are you, Lord? What will you have me to do? Two questions. In the NASB, it doesn't come. In the King James Version, you get it. And Paul says it later on in his testimony. There were two questions he asked the Lord. Who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do? Two questions that he kept on asking all through life. Who are you, Lord? I want to know you better. To know Christ is the passion of my life. Second question, I want to know your will. What do you want me to do? And the Lord did not give him a whole plan as to where all he's going to go. He, he gave him a little inkling that he was going to suffer, but he said, go into the city and I'll tell you what to do. God leads us step by step. You say, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord says, for the time being, verse 6, just go to the city. That's all. And when you go to the city, I'll tell you what to do next. God leads us step by step. And when he went to the city, there was another man to whom God spoke in Damascus called Ananias. See, it's wonderful to see how these people were sensitive to the Spirit. The Lord said to Ananias, verse 10, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. 
The Lord said, go to that city called, street called Straight. There's a man there called Saul of Tarsus. He's praying and he's fasting. He is not eating and drinking. From verse 9 it says, he didn't eat and drink for three days. And you'll see him. And he, I've already given him a vision that a man called Ananias will come and pray for him. Go. And Ananias had some questions, but he went. See, when the Lord sends you somewhere, what we learn from this is the Lord is already preparing people at the other end to receive your ministry. If you go on your own, you don't know whether the Lord has prepared somebody at the other end or not. But here you see the Lord sent Ananias and he says, don't worry, I've prepared that man and he'll receive your word. It's a wonderful thing to be one of those who spends your time listening to God. And he went, Ananias, his humble unknown brother, he never hear of him again. He went and laid hands on the man who was to be the greatest apostle in the world and said, Paul, God wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You were converted. You were born again on that road to Damascus. Now you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. See, this was so uh, important. All those disciples realized it. It's not enough to be converted. You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately his eyes were opened and he took some food and he was strengthened. And I just want to say one last thing from chapter 9. When they were threatening his life, verse 25, he had to be lowered in a basket through a window. This great man who was going to be the greatest apostle in the world. And he mentioned that in 2 Corinthians 11 saying, you know, God humbled me. Can you imagine this man sitting in a basket and escaping for his life? You know, in the previous chapter you read how God lifted Peter, uh, lifted Philip and uh, took him off to another place. Snatched Philip away, Acts 8, 39. God could have done that for Paul when the people were surrounding Damascus to kill him. God's way is not always the same. Sometimes we have to go in a very humiliating way to escape from our enemies. Let's thank God that he's in control, saves us one way or the other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of these godly men who have gone ahead of us as leaders in the church. Help us to follow in their footsteps and to glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Acts of the Apostles and chapter 10. Here we read of the Word of God going to the Gentiles. You know, Jesus said that you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we saw how it started in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, and then the regions of Judea. Acts chapter 8, it went to Samaria. And it's gradually now going to the uttermost parts of the earth, to people who are non-Jews. And Peter was the one who was given the privilege to open the door to the Jews in Acts chapter 2 and also given the privilege to open the door to the non-Jews in Acts chapter 10. I want you to notice something here that when Cornelius was praying he was a man who knew nothing of the Bible nothing of God he did not worship idols but we could say he was praying to the God in heaven who he did not know who he was like a lot of people today. They are not necessarily idol worshippers, they are not Christians. But there are some people seeking after God like Cornelius. And the amazing thing is, it says here in verse 4, that uh, while he was praying, in the ninth hour of the day, while he was praying, he was a very devout man, verse 2, one who feared God, gave a lot of money to poor people, prayed to God continually, knowing nothing of the Bible, nothing of Jesus Christ. And the thir in the three o'clock in the afternoon when he was praying, he saw a vision. An angel of God appeared to him and said, the last part of verse 4, your prayers and your alms, the money given to the poor, have ascended as a memorial before God. Now some of us may think, that God does not listen to the prayers of such sincere people who are praying not knowing anything about the Bible or about Jesus. If that were the case, you had to say that verse 4 is not true. 
but God sent an angel from heaven to this Cornelius who did not know anything about the Bible, anything about Jesus. He was praying. God said, I've heard your prayers. I've seen the money that you were giving to the poor. You know, God, with God there is no partiality. And wherever people are sincerely seeking him, he meets with them. Sometimes beyond our understanding. Now we can have a prejudice like Peter had. No, 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 no. no. God cannot meet with them. That is impossible. God only meets with us. Peter was like that. God can only meet with us. And God had to change Peter's opinion to enlarge his heart. See, Peter had this opinion. We are clean. Those fellows are unclean. And so God gave him a vision when Peter was praying one day. It says he had a vision of a great sheet coming down from heaven, verse 11, with all kinds of animals inside, clean animals and unclean animals. And the voice said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. There are pigs there. Kill and eat it. And Peter said, No means, Lord. I will never touch anything unclean or unholy, verse 14. And the voice came and said, What God has cleansed, don't call unholy. And this had to happen three times before Peter got convinced, verse 16. And while he was perplexed, saying, what does this vision mean? What is God trying to... He knew it was a vision. It was not an actual pig or a lizard over there. But it was a vision of unclean animals, which he knew that the law of Moses forbade him from eating. And God was saying, eat it. What does this vision mean? And then as soon as he was thinking like that, the, these people from Cornelius' house reached Peter's house. Because God had told... Cornelius through the angel, go and ask Peter um, to come and give you a message. Now, I want to ask you a question. When the angel came to Cornelius' house, did the angel know the gospel that Jesus had died for the sins of the world and Jesus rose up from the dead? What do you think? Did he know the gospel or not? He certainly did. Why couldn't he preach the gospel himself instead of waiting for three days for Peter to come? That's a very important question. You need to know the answer for that. What was it that Peter had that the angel did not have? I'm sure the angel could have explained the gospel ten times better than Peter. Definitely. But there was something that Peter had which the angel did not have. And that was the experience of salvation. Only Peter had the experience of salvation and only one who has had an experience of salvation can speak about salvation. That is a principle in the Acts of the Apostles. What did we see in Acts 1.1? 1, 1? He did and taught. We have the experience, then we teach it. The angel did not have an experience, and so even though he knew the gospel very clearly, he's not permitted to speak it. What is the message for you and me? If you don't have an experience, don't speak about it. Learn a lesson from the angels. Even though they know it better than anybody else, they keep quiet about it because they say, sorry, we can't speak it. We don't have the experience. Please send for that brother. Uh, he can't explain it half as well as I can, but he's got the experience, so he can teach you better. Remember this. With all your Bible study and knowledge, if you don't have the experience, you cannot speak about it. You're wasting your time. Peter had to come. He may be a humble brother who knows less than you, but he's got the experience, and he's the one who's going to speak about it. And when, um, when Peter was thinking like that, the Lord told him, see, three men are looking for you. Go and don't have any misgivings. Then he understood what this vision meant, that these are unclean people, Gentiles. I must not go and eat with them. And when he came to Cornelius' house, we read that Cornelius fell down and worshipped Peter, verse 25 and Peter said get up I'm just a man and then he said about this vision that God gave him and said now I have understood what this vision means now I understand verse 35 10 35 now I know that in every nation in every nation and every denomination the man who fears God and does what is right is welcome to him. Is that right? I believe it is. 
God will lead such a man onwards to Christ. I'm not saying such a man is saved. Cornelius was not saved. Definitely not. But God leads such people on. He welcomes them. He hears that person who doesn't know the truth crying out to him. And he welcomes him. He receives him. And he longs to send you to tell that man about salvation. What if Peter had said, Lord, I'm not going to go. Like today God calls somebody and the man says, I'm not willing to go. What would happen? Will Cornelius get lost because of Peter's disobedience? That would be very unrighteous of God to make Cornelius suffer for Peter's disobedience. No. If Peter had not gone, God would have sent James or John or somebody else. If you don't go, well, you miss the opportunity. God will give that privilege to somebody else. God will give your ministry to somebody else. So that's all there is to it. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, when Jesus' ministry is being described by Peter, Peter expresses it like this. Beautiful word. You know Jesus of Nazareth. God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Power. That's the mark of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus never spoke in tongues throughout his life. He did not need to speak in tongues. You know the reason why Jesus never spoke in tongues? It's very important to know the reason for that. He never had the gift of tongues. He had the gift of healing, miracles, discernment, prophecy, everything. But he never had tongues. What is the reason for that? See, tongues is because our fellowship with God is so imperfect that he gives us another language to be able to communicate with him more perfectly. When we get to heaven and our communication is perfect, tongues, there will be no more tongues. When Jesus lived on earth, his communication with the Father was so perfect that he never needed the gift of tongues. That's the reason Jesus never spoke in tongues. And it says Jesus was anointed with power and he went about doing good. When you are anointed with power, what is the first thing you'll do? Good to other people. If you do not know how to go around doing good to other people, brother, seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. So that you can go around doing good to people, number one. Secondly, you will go around delivering people who are oppressed by the devil. We are surrounded by people who are oppressed by the devil. People committing suicide, people who are discouraged, people who are sick, people who are demon-possessed, people who are harassed, wives who are being harassed by their husbands, and husbands who are being harassed by their wives, and all types of things are going on in the world around us. And God has placed us in the midst of such a world to go and deliver these people from the oppression of the devil. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit for that. Even Jesus needed to be anointed to do that ministry. How much more you and I? And he did it. Why? Because God was with him. And when you are anointed with the Holy Spirit in your ministry, it will be written about you, God was with you. When you went to deliver that person, God was with you. When you stood in the pulpit, God was with you. This is how God is with us, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we move on to chapter 11. A number of things there about the spread of the gospel. I just want to go down to verse 27. At this time, some prophets came. I want to speak to you a word about prophets. There was a man named Agabus who stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there will be a famine all over the world. He didn't say when, because the times and epochs are not for us to know, Acts 1-7. But he said, God has shown me there's going to be a famine pretty soon, perhaps. I don't know when. <clears throat> and this took place in the reign of Claudius. And what did the disciples do when they heard, oh, there's going to be a famine? In, um, then we must collect money because these people in Antioch were rich. So they heard that the people in Jerusalem were poor. So they collected money and sent a contribution, verse 29, for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. All collection of money that you read of in the New Testament, whether it is here, or 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2, or 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, always the collection of money 
was for poor people. You never say, I never see Paul telling people, take a collection for me. Never. <laughs> he always said, there are poor people there. Please give it to them. And he wouldn't touch it himself. So there is an exhortation in, in the New Testament telling believers to give money. But if you read carefully, it was always asking them to give money to somebody else. Not to me. Not saying give it to my ministry because I need to buy a house or rent a house and I want you to support me. I am the Lord's servant. No, Paul trusted the Lord to provide his need. But he did urge believers to give money because there were poor believers who needed help. And so they took a collection and sent it. And this they sent through Barnabas and Saul. So God used the famine to bring these Gentiles in Antioch closer to the Jews in Jerusalem. You know, there was a big division between the Jews and Gentiles. And here in Antioch, we read a number of Gentiles were getting converted, as we read in Acts 11.21. How to bring these Jews and Gentiles together? The Lord says, let's send a famine. <laughs> and when the famine comes, these rich Gentiles will send money to the poor Jews and they'll learn to love one another. What do we learn from that? Some of the troubles and trials God sends into our life and into our churches is in order to bring believers together who are far apart from each other. Yeah, some believer is in hospital, sick, and all the other believers rally around and provide food for his family and provide money for his hospital expenses. What is the result of that? Not just his sickness. He comes out of the hospital after three weeks, but he comes out much more closely linked to the body of Christ. Through what? Through some message? No, through sickness. So God uses sickness, famine, all types of things to bring believers together to make them one. Give thanks for everything God permits. And the other thing we see here is <clears throat> that Barnabas and Saul were the ones who went from here to Jerusalem. Okay, keep that in mind. And in the next chapter, we read about James being killed by the sword, verse 2, and Peter being delivered from prison because it says here, when Peter was imprisoned, verse 5 of chapter 12, fervent prayer was made by the church to God. And who were the people watching this fervent prayer? Barnabas and Saul, who had just come. Chapter 11, verse 30, with the money. And they had never seen a prayer meeting like this. Terrific prayer meeting, morning, night, prayer meeting, and they see one day Peter is at the door. He has come out of the prison. And that really shook them up. In Antioch, they were doing a lot of teaching. But now when they came to Jerusalem and they blessed the people in Jerusalem with money, they got a blessing in return. What is that blessing they got in return? They got a vision of what prayer can do. And they came back to Antioch in chapter 13 and they began to pray over there. Where did they learn how to pray? In Jerusalem. What did they go to Jerusalem for? To give money. And they got a blessing in return, learned how to pray and came back in chapter 13 and started praying with the others and God spoke to them in the middle of that prayer meeting and said, separate me Saul and Barnabas for the ministry. See, God is using all these means to teach one another. Whenever you bless somebody else, that person blesses you in another way. You may bless him materially, he may bless you spiritually. You may bless him spiritually, he may bless you materially. But God makes the body of Christ linked with each other. You see that again and again. One more thing I want to say to you from this prophecy of Agabus, Acts 11:28. It's very important to know that in the Old Testament, people went to the prophets and said, what shall I do? And the prophet said, do this, go here, go there. Why did the prophets have to say that in the Old Testament? Because none of these other people had the Holy Spirit. Only the prophet had the Holy Spirit. But in the New Covenant, the Lord said, they shall not teach every man his neighbor, saying, know the Lord. In the New Covenant, Acts chapter, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 8. But all shall know me. So there's no need for the prophet to tell that person now, you can go here or you shouldn't go there. No. Then the prophet is taking the place of the Holy Spirit. In my lifetime, many, 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 many people in many, many places have come to me to find the will of God for their lives. 
and I have never tried to do it. I said, I will not find the will of God for your life because that will be taking the place of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I dare not take the place of the Holy Spirit in your life because I am a man who fears God. Some other fellow who doesn't fear God may take the place of the Holy Spirit in your life, but I will not do it. I want the Holy Spirit to have the rightful place in your life, so I will not find God's will for you. I can give you advice. When you ask me, should I do this or should I do that, I can tell you uh, with a certain amount of wisdom I've had with walking with the Lord for so many years, these are the advantages, these are the disadvantages, consider this, consider this. So what should I do, brother? Think of all the things I told you, go and pray to God, and God will tell you whether you should take this job or travel here or not. Should I marry this girl? I say, I don't know. I can tell you what I know about this girl or what I know about this boy. I can give you, but you've got to find God's will yourself. Don't ever try to find God's will for somebody else. Don't ever try to take the place of God in somebody else's life. Oh, there are multitudes of people who call themselves prophets today who are taking the place of God. Like it says in Second Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist sits in the temple, takes the place of God. There are these prophets today who are sitting in the church, taking the place of God, telling people what to do. Taking the place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you. He's a jealous spirit. He does not want to give his place in your life to some wretched prophet, false prophet. No, he wants to tell you himself. So what should a true man of God do? A man of God should give you advice show you the advantages, disadvantages, and point you to the Holy Spirit. What did Agabus do here? Read carefully. Did Agabus say, there's going to be a famine, so take a collection? No. He knew where to stop. Today's prophets don't know where to stop. He said, there's going to be a famine, full stop. That's all. I'm not going to say anything more. What should you do about it? I'm not going to tell you. You got the Holy Spirit, seek God. They sought God. And God told them to send a contribution. They did that. Agabus did not tell them what to do. Directive prophecy is never found in the New Testament. Directive prophecy is an Old Testament feature because people didn't have the Holy Spirit. Very, very important to understand that if you want to be saved from the deception that goes by the name of prophecy. There's plenty of it in here in Kerala, plenty of it in Northeast India, in the states over there, in different places particularly like this. People who sit with their... They take their fees, profits fees. It's just like a doctor's consulting room. You go there and you pay your fees and get your prophecy and go. It's all a deception. And you find people who go there never grow in the Lord because they have no contact with the Holy Spirit. Next time they want to find something, they've got to contact the prophet again. This is all deception. Don't be deceived by it. Agabus was a true prophet who said something and left it for people to decide what to do. Later on you read in Acts 21, Agabus said, Thus says the Lord, the man who owns this girdle, that is Paul, he will be bound in Jerusalem. Full stop. He didn't tell Paul whether to go or not to go. There were other self-appointed prophets over there who said, No, the Lord says don't go. Paul said, Rubbish, I'm going. Agabus knew where to stop. Those self-appointed false prophets there in Acts 21 did not know where to stop. We find both categories of people today. A prophet in the Old Testament never, never, never told other people what to do in the New Testament. In the Old Testament they did. Okay, God's sovereignty we see in Acts chapter 12 in delivering Peter but allowing James to die. I don't know why James died. God could have delivered James just as he delivered Peter. He could have sent an angel three days earlier and delivered James from prison. But when a man's time is up in God's diary, God does not send an angel. He just takes him to heaven. When God's time is not up, then he will deliver him. Jeremiah and Uriah both prophesied. We saw Uriah died. Jeremiah lived. James died. Peter was alive. And Peter comes to the meeting and testifies. God delivered me. And sitting in the meeting is Mrs. James. Perhaps thinking, why didn't God deliver my husband? Do you wonder why God does not, did not do something for you, which he did for another brother? Humble yourself and say, Lord, that's your sovereign plan. I'm so happy that you did it for that brother. 
That's what Mrs. James should say. My husband died a few days ago. He was killed. Lord, you could have delivered him like you delivered Peter. He's standing here now. Mrs. Peter is so happy. And I'm, I want to rejoice with Mrs. Peter for the work you have done for her husband, even though you allowed my husband to die. That is a godly woman who recognizes the sovereignty of God in delivering one and allowing another person to die. So often sicknesses, one person is healed, another person is not. Learn to rejoice when God deals like that with that person if he's not dealt like that with you. So there are many lessons like this we learn. Acts chapter 13, we read about the first great missionary movement out of Antioch. They come back and they've learned how to pray. And the Lord says in verse 2, it's a very important principle of missionary work here, you read in Acts 13, verse 1 and 2. There were a number of prophets and teachers there, and they fasted and worshipped the Lord. They were not only fasting and praying, they were fasting and worshipping, asking for nothing. Lord, we worship you. Thou alone art worthy. Fasting and worshipping. It's a wonderful thing to fast and worship. And while they were fasting and worshipping, the Holy Spirit spoke in a way that all those five people there got a deep conviction, this is what God is saying. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. It didn't stop there. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have already called them. I'm not calling them now. Some people think this is the call of Saul and Barnabas. No. I have already called them. The call of God is always personal and private. It may be confirmed in public. Like this is a public meeting where the call was confirmed. But this was not the call. Don't ever get a call when somebody says, Thus says the Lord, you are called to go here. Or you are called to marry so and so. Garbage. Throw it in the garbage bin. If God wants you to do something, he'll speak to you privately. He may confirm it through other elders publicly, but always to the work to which I've already called them. Saul and Barnabas already heard the call. They were thinking about it, thinking about it, and suddenly in the meeting, the other elders say, hey, we get a confirmation you should be like this. It's wonderful. I remember when the day when God called me, I mentioned it the other day, it's the 6th of May, 1964. And I remember nobody knew I was sitting reading the scriptures. I was in the midst of traveling. I was on leave that time. I was traveling around in an evangelistic team having meetings. And I was reading the scriptures and God called me very clearly. It was personal, private. It was very clear. And while I was seriously considering and I just thinking of quitting my job, a man of God, who was the greatest man of God I've respected in this country in my life, he's dead now, came to me and said, are you thinking of leaving your job? When are you leaving your job? It was prophetic. That man was a prophet. And that was an external confirmation to what God had already called me. If God calls you, he'll call you personally. The confirmation may come from other godly men, but you must get the call yourself. That's what we see here. And they went out, sent out by the, and the power of God was with them, and you see a number of things there. Let me show you one thing in one of the sermons that Paul preached in verse 36. It says about David that he served his generation in the will of God and then fell asleep. Do you know, my brothers and sisters, that you can only serve your generation? In another generation, God has to raise up another man, another woman. But in your generation, make sure you serve God's purpose and fulfill all of God's will in your generation before you pass on. And if you want to do that, you must be like it says here, I have found David a man after my own heart. 
That's the type of person you are to be. And he served in his own generation. And he died. If you also, like David, are a man after God's own heart, then like it says here in verse 36, you can serve your generation in the will of God and move on. So verse 22 where it says, I found David after my own heart, is linked with verse 36. Okay. We move on to chapter 14. And we read of the signs and wonders that the Lord did there. And um, it's very interesting that we see that in one place where in one, at one moment they were almost worshipping them, verse 13, they brought garlands and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds to Paul and Barnabas because they saw them doing a miracle. A few moments later in verse 19, they were stoning them to death, going to stone them to death. See how fickle-minded the crowd is. One moment they are praising you, next moment they want to stone you. We read of Jesus in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. He started preaching. People said, what gracious words he's speaking. And then he said something to hurt them. And they stopped him in the middle of the sermon, pulled him out, and took him outside to kill him. But they didn't succeed in killing Jesus, and they didn't succeed in killing Paul. They stoned Paul, verse 19, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Does God allow his greatest servants to be treated like this? He does. I remember once hearing a story of a man who was an unbeliever. Somebody was witnessing to him and that man's son had died in some bad way. Some others had killed him or something like that. And so this unbeliever said to this believer who was witnessing to him, Where was your God when my son died? And the believer told him, God was in the same place where he was when his own son died on the cross. He didn't stop evil people from killing his son. He didn't stop evil people from killing Peter, Paul, James. All the apostles except John, as far as we know, were killed. The greatest servants of Jesus Christ in history were killed. And God did not stop them from killing his greatest servants. This is not like the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God did not allow anybody to kill Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or David or Elijah or Joshua. They all died natural deaths. But this, we are in the New Covenant now. And in the New Covenant, almost all of God's great, greatest servants, the apostles, were all killed. But only in God's time. It was not time for Paul to die, so they, he allowed the people to think that Paul was dead. They dragged him out. And you know, if you look at the time factor, uh, when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I knew a man 14 years ago who went up to heaven and came back. He was talking about himself. The time factor relates it to this particular time. This is probably the time when Paul went up to heaven and came back. When he was dragged, thrown outside, stoned to death, but God rewarded him with a trip up to heaven and came back. And he's never told us what he saw there in heaven. Yeah, you can be sure that if God allows you to face intense suffering, he'll give you some intense rewards also. Great suffering comes with great rewards. Verse 22. And after that, it says, Paul went somewhere. And verse 21, returned to Lystra, to the same place where he was stoned. He was not afraid. He came back and he strengthened the souls of the disciples and don't get discouraged. They stoned me. And through much tribulation, verse 22, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when a man like Paul stood up and said that with all the scars on his face and the wounds which are still healing, and such a man says through much tribulation, you've got to enter the kingdom of God, is much more impressive than me standing here and saying it. So those who are called to be, God gives them the honor of being persecuted for the kingdom's sake. They are extremely valuable in God's eyes. The second thing Paul did there was verse 23. He appointed elders in every church. You never find in the New Testament pastors being appointed in any church. Never. No church in the New Testament was run by one pastor. Pastor is not an office. It is a gift. It's a shepherd. 
It's a gift of shepherding people. Like apostle is a gift. Evangelist is a gift. Ephesians 4. It's not an office. The office is, is the office of elder. And always there was more than one elder in every church. They appointed elders in every church. And prayed with fasting because in New Testament ministry, it's not like one Elijah, one Abraham, one Elisha, one Moses. No. In New Testament ministry, you need a minimum of two people to express the body of Christ. Because Jesus said, where two are gathered together, there I am in the midst. So you have to have two elders for the Lord to be present there to manifest his power when they bind Satan and lead the church on. And also, the balance. Separate me, not Saul alone, but Saul and Barnabas. Not Peter alone going to pray. Peter and John, we read in Acts 3, going to pray. Saul and Barnabas, two elders. Always in the New Testament, you find this principle of two. Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. This one man pastor is never found anywhere in the New Testament. It's, I know it's practiced in Christendom, like 101 other unscriptural practices are practiced. But all I'm trying to show you is, if you have the courage to believe it, it is not found in the New Testament. They appointed elders. Acts chapter 15, we read of a controversy concerning circumcision. And the apostles did a wise thing. They came together, verse 6, to look into this matter because they wanted, didn't want any controversy. Remember, this is a time when Scripture was not written. We don't have such controversies today because we got the New Testament. But they were living in a time when the New Testament was not written. They were in that transition period and the apostles spoke the word of God. There was no written New Testament those days. So they needed to come together to clarify these things. And after some days, verse 36, Acts 15, 36, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit some of these brothers. Let's go back and establish them. Now we learned something from this. I don't think the world has ever seen a greater evangelist than the apostle Paul. A greater man who had a greater burden for reaching the lost and reaching lost souls. Many times he used to say, I want to preach Christ where he's never been named. I don't want to build on another man's foundation. I want to go where Christ, nobody, people have never heard of Jesus Christ. What a passion he had. And this man, who had such a passion for evangelism, here what does he say? He's not talking about evangelism. He's talking about building the church. Why doesn't he tell Barnabas, let us go to some other places where the gospel has never been preached? That's not what he says. Well, weren't there other places where the gospel was not preached? Hundreds and thousands of places. But he says, let us go back to the cities where we have already preached the word of God and let's see how they are. Because he knew the value of building the fellowship of the local church and making them disciples, not just evangelism. The greatest evangelist is speaking. You can't be better than this man. So Barnabas said, listen, we should take along Mark. Mark was the person who came with them the first time and dropped out halfway because he found it was tough, this missionary work. And Paul said, you cannot take him. Barnabas, Mark was his nephew. Barnabas said, we must take him. And it says the disagreement with them between them, verse 39, was so sharp that they separated. Paul said, okay, you take Barnabas, you take Mark, I can't take him. The Holy Spirit had brought Saul and Barnabas together. Saul was a very hard man, speaking of truth. Barnabas was a soft man, speaking of grace. Between them, the glory of God was seen, full of grace and truth. When they separated, how sad. Was that separation the will of God? Definitely not. God does not desire those whom he has called together to separate. Particularly when they perfectly balance out each other. You see the balance right here. Paul was hard. Don't take Mark. Barnabas says, Paul, you also got a second chance. Let's give him a second chance. If they had learned to work together, how different it would have been. Much later in life, Paul says, yeah, Mark is profitable for the ministry. Remember, these apostles also made mistakes. Acts of the Apostles is full of a number of mistakes the apostles made. And they um, learned from those mistakes. I, I'm sure if Paul had, if this had happened when Paul was 60 years old, 
he would not have reacted like that. And Barnabas also would not have reacted like that. They'd have found a way to solve that problem. But they were in their 30s, maybe 39, 40, full of zeal, not that much wisdom. They made mistakes. And that's a great encouragement for us to know that apostles made mistakes and we'll make mistakes. But God used it for the furtherance of the gospel because now instead of one team going, two teams went. Both had one experienced person in it. Barnabas took Mark and went, and Paul chose Silas and went. So the gospel spread even more. So God uses the things that the devil does for the furtherance of the gospel. So praise the Lord. And when he went to Timothy, uh, when he went to Derbe, he met a d disciple called Timothy, chapter 16, verse 1. It was Paul who chose Silas, but God had planned some other co-worker for Paul. And that was Timothy. And so immediately after Barnabas is taken away, God says, okay, you, Paul, you need another gentle type of person. You're too hard. And he gives him a very gentle co-worker, Timothy, who was another Barnabas. How did this affect John Mark? I think John Mark was blessed by Paul's attitude and Barnabas's attitude. He was blessed by Paul's attitude because Paul Mark must have realized, yeah, that's serious what I did last time. Just drop out half the way. What Paul says is right. I better take my Christian life more seriously in future. Paul helped him to think like that. At the same time, he didn't get discouraged and give up because Barnabas gave him a second chance. So grace and truth, when both ministries operate together, they bless people. And so we read here that Paul saw this young man, Timothy, outstanding, and took him. And another mistake Paul made here, verse 3, he circumcised him to please the Jews. Paul made a lot of mistakes. Don't follow him in everything. And we read in verse 9, he saw a vision. Here we give a, get an understanding of Christian leadership. Paul had a vision. Everybody didn't, in the team didn't get a vision. One man, the leader, got the vision, which said, come to Macedonia and help us. And now listen to this word, verse 10. It's a beautiful verse. When Paul saw the vision, all of us sought to go to Macedonia. They had such confidence in the leadership of Paul, they said, Paul, you've seen the vision, that's enough. God doesn't have to give a vision to all of us. We, were, we are absolutely convinced, verse 10, that God has called us to go to Macedonia. It's wonderful when teams can work like this with absolute confidence in their leader. The leader sees a vision and the team says, fine, we're going that way. I want to say to all of you, don't be a loner. There are many loners in India. Loners means people who work all by themselves, alone, with no leadership, no fellowship. A lot of freedom. I can do what I like. I arrange my own program. I do this, I do that, and I do the other thing. I tell you, ultimately you'll destroy yourself. It's just a matter of time. You need a God-given leader to guide you. And you're on very dangerous ground. You may not believe it today. You think you're all right. Just wait another five years and see what happens. And you'll believe the truth of what I say. And it says here, one more thing I want to point out to you is that in verse 6, they passed through the Galatian region and were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. How did the Holy Spirit forbid them? Do you know? You read in Galatians chapter 4 that Paul says, I preached the gospel to you because I was sick. That means it was Paul got sick. He, was, he didn't want to stop in Galatia. He was going to another place called Asia Minor. But on the way, when he was in Galatia, he fell sick. And because he was sick, he could not go where he wanted to go. And he had to stay there and people came and he preached the gospel. And people got converted and the church was formed in Galatia. See God's will in stopping Paul by a sickness in order to establish a church in the place where Paul got sick. So don't think when you get sick, you miss the will of God. Not necessarily. A church got established in Galatia because Paul was sick. But here it is said he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit, but we are not told how. Sometimes the Holy Spirit stops us through sickness. 
There are many wonderful things like this in the whole Acts of the Apostles where you can learn the principles of serving God and the, learn from the mistakes of the Apostles too. We see one thing here about um, a demon-possessed girl saying, verse 17, following after Paul and saying, These are the servants of the Most High God. And Paul virtually told him, Shut up. I command you to get out in the name of Jesus. I don't want a testimony from demons. Paul did not want any testimony from demons, just like Jesus did not want demons to say he's the Son of God. Don't ever receive a testimony from demons. Chapter 17, it says here in verse 10 and 11, Paul and Silas went to Berea, and the people in Berea were more noble because they received the word of God with great eagerness and studied the scriptures. What is the result of that? The result is there is no epistle of Paul to the Bereans. Why? Because they already had the habit of checking up what every preacher said with the word of God. And those who keep checking up everything that anything they hear with the word of God will not go astray. Like some of those other people in the other places in Galatia and other all needed correction in their teaching. Okay, we move on to uh, chapter... 18, where we read of the Apostle Paul, the Lord telling the Apostle Paul when he was in Corinth, don't be afraid of all the opposition, verse 9 and 10. Keep on speaking boldly because I've got many people in this city. Just because there's opposition does not mean we should run away. Seek the Lord, and if the Lord says go, go. But the Lord may tell you, stay on, because I'm gonna, nobody can harm you here. It's always good to develop the habit of listening to God not to go only by outside circumstances. We must never move on the basis of fear. We must move on the basis of God leading us. A wonderful example in verse 24 and 28 of a godly sister who could help a brother get more light. Priscilla was the wife of Aquila and it seems as though she was more spiritual and perhaps had a better understanding of scripture because uh, verse 26, it's written Priscilla and Aquila giving us a little indication that perhaps he was more spiritual. They took Apollos, who did not know the scriptures properly aside, took him home, explained the word of God to him, the way of God to him more accurately. Here was a sister who knew her place. She did not try to teach without her husband. She called her husband, called Apollos home, called him for a meal, and shared the word of God with him along with her husband and led this man to a better understanding and ultimately he became a mighty servant of God. Sisters have a unique ministry in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19 we read about certain people to whom Paul asked this question, verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we never heard the Holy, about the Holy Spirit. Then he says, into what were you baptized? Now this verse, by the way, proves that, that they did not baptize in the name of Jesus in those days. How do you get that from this verse? Because when they said, we haven't heard about the Holy Spirit, he said, then what were you baptized? In what name were you baptized? Because they were supposed to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's the point. That's how they were baptized those days. So he said, you have to have heard about the Holy Spirit because that would have been there in your baptism. And then they said, we were not baptized that way. Then he discovered they were baptized only with John's baptism. And so he preached the gospel to them. They accepted the Lord. And they were baptized. Verse 5. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. After they were born again, and after they were baptized, Paul laid his hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they began speaking in unknown tongues and prophesying. Just like in Cornelius' house, as Paul, Peter was praying, the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius' house and they spake in unknown tongues. Notice the different ways the Holy Spirit came on people. In Acts chapter 2, there was no preaching, they were just waiting, the Holy Spirit came. In Acts chapter 10, before Cornelius was baptized, without anybody laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit came. Here, after they were baptized, through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit come. 
it teaches us that the Holy Spirit can come with laying on of hands, without laying on of hands, before baptism, after water baptism, all by yourself when you're praying. Paul was alone praying, and God sent Ananias. So it's different ways. The important thing is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 20, we read about Paul giving a testimony to the elders in Ephesus. After having been there for three years, this is a wonderful passage, and I would encourage you to read from verse 17 to verse 35. It's a beautiful passage demonstrating how a true servant of God should serve the Lord. He says, I preach repentance and faith, verse 21. I've spent three years here, and he says, in all these three years, you have seen, not listened to my sermons only, but verse 18 and 19, you've seen how I have lived here and served you with all humility. He points to his life. He's not ashamed to say, look at my life. Come and see. Look at my example. Don't be ashamed to show other people the example of your life and talk about it, not just your sermons. And he says, now I'm going be on God for yourself, verse 28, because I know what will happen after I go, verse 29, wolves will come in. Why couldn't the wolves come in when Paul was there? Because Paul was a very strict gatekeeper. Every church needs a very strict gatekeeper if you want to keep the wolves outside. When that gatekeeper goes away and all the diplomatic elders take over, all the wolves come right in. That's what happened. And Paul was there for three years. So every church needs a strong leader who makes sure that the wolves get the whip. Otherwise, the church will be destroyed. And Paul's example in verse 33 to 34 and 35, he said, you see how I worked with my own hands, earned my living, supported myself so that I did not take any money from you, I did not take any clothes from you, and I supported not only myself but these people with me to give you an example how we should serve the Lord. In Acts chapter 21, we read about this time when the, I told you these false prophets. False prophets means not false in the sense of evil, but they went beyond what the Holy Spirit said. They said to Paul, verse 4, you should not set foot in Jerusalem. Paul was in a meeting, and uh, they were in Tyre, and they, Paul was attending a meeting, and there, Acts 21, 5, uh, 4, somebody got up and said, Thus says the Lord, Apostle Paul, you should not go to Jerusalem. Agabus also came a little later and prophesied in verse 11 in another town. And what does he tell Paul? He only says, Paul, you'll be bound in Jerusalem, but I cannot tell you whether you should go or not to go. You see the difference? One are immature people who don't know how to prophesy, Agabus was a mature prophet. He knew, I cannot tell this man what to do or what not to do. Paul said, I'm going. And he went. Now let us find out whether Paul went in the will of God or outside the will of God. Acts 23, 11. The Lord appeared to Paul at night and said, Take courage, Paul. As you have witnessed in Jerusalem, you will witness in Rome also. Some people say because Paul was jailed, he missed the will of God. He didn't. The Lord said, you are in the will of God. If he had listened to those prophets who said, don't go to Jerusalem, he would not have gone to Jerusalem, he would not have gone to Rome. It was in Rome that he sat down and wrote Philippians and Colossians when he was locked up there. We would not have got the letters to the Philippians and the Colossians and all if he had listened to those people who were giving him directive prophecy. When you listen to people who give you directive prophecy, you can miss the will of God too. Acts 24, 16, a lovely verse that tells us one secret of Paul's life. I always maintain a conscience blameless before God and before men. Whenever his conscience troubled him, he set it right immediately. Acts 26, 19, another secret of Paul's life. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision God gave me. You can read the rest of those stories, that beautiful story in Acts 27 where the whole, where the ship got wrecked and nobody in that ship was lost. Reason? Because there was one man of God on that ship. 
Do you know the blessing a ship gets if one man of God is on that ship? Do you know the blessing a town gets if one man of God is in that town? Be a man of God like that. In conclusion, chapter 28, verse 31. Paul stayed two full years, verse 30 and 31. In his own rented quarters, he paid the rent for his own house. He did not ask the church in Rome to pay his rent. He was a man who was free. He paid his own rent for two years and preached the kingdom of God and with all openness, unhindered. Paul comes through in... This is the place where he wrote Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians. Sitting there for two years, imprisoned as a soldier of Rome, he fulfilled God's purpose. Paul comes through in the Acts of the Apostles as a unique example of a servant of God. He supported himself and served the Lord. Not all did that. Peter, James, John, they were fishermen. They could not carry their boat with them. But Peter, but Paul was a tent maker. All he had to carry was a needle with him. And uh, he could support himself. Some people are called to support themselves and serve the Lord, like Paul. Some people are called to be supported by others, like Jesus, Peter, James, John. It's not a question of how you're supported. It's a question of being faithful with the money you receive, seeking the glory of God, ultimately trusting God to provide your need. Many, many areas we can see Paul's unique example. And let's follow his example and serve the Lord in our day and age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of this wonderful godly man who lived 20 centuries ago, whose example challenges us even today. Help us to follow his example as he followed Christ, we ask in Jesus' name.